Thank you. Thank you very much, Akasha, for setting this up so well. As Akasha mentioned, this is our third spotlight. This one is in recognition of Hispanic Heritage Month and Latinx and the conversations that are currently going on in society uh, regarding this very important issue for our society, which is how do we manage over time uh, becoming more diverse and what does it mean to be inclusive and how do we live into this moment in our own contemporary society but also as graduate educators. So I'm Katrina Rogers. I'm the president of Fielding. I think you all know that. It's my honor to serve in this role and I, I just wanted to remind everyone that part of this work, the spotlights are very important because one, they're a way that we enliven and make more visible the work and the social issues that Fielding is committed to and wants to learn more about. It's part of our strategic plan. We have an inclusion plan and a strategic plan that are united together. And in objectives one around, or excuse me, goal one around enhancing and strengthening a student learner graduate education, the inclusion plan is a very important core Part, important part of that. And then also in goal three around uh, strengthening our academic excellence and quality and innovation. And so we see these, I see these kinds of events as making our work more visible, as providing space for faculty, staff, students, alumni, trustees, anyone who's part of the fielding community to engage in substantive conversation and discussion about things that matter. I also want to just say uh, on behalf of those students and the faculty and staff that we really are wanting to be even more welcoming to, to all people. And living into this idea of what is inclusion is really to me a critical task at hand for fielding. So I've been enjoying all the support and the building of relationships and laying the foundations for our diversity inclusion work, which is just taking on more and more momentum and I want to call out and thank um, Placida Gallegos as our inclusion council chair since 2017 for uh, holding the, shining the light on the work that needs to be done and really helping us with the collaborative and many other people to uh, prepare for fielding to really be a different kind of community over the next several years. So in doing so, I'm pleased to be part of the spotlight today. And I just wanted to go ahead and point out, as soon as I can make my computer work, I want to introduce you to uh, the people who are going to be speaking on the call. And many of you know, um, know each other already, and I feel like I know so many of you so well. So I'm just gonna do it in the order of the biographies that I think you've already received. But Patricia Arredondo, thank you, Patricia, for being here today. I'll just say hello. Unmute. Uh, good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. And it's a delight to be part of this uh, educational cultural spotlight. I'm in Mexico City, where I've had a chance to be engaged in all the excitement around the uh, ind independence celebration last evening and today. So it's a, a different kind of cultural experience for me. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for being here today. I also just wanted to say uh, thank you over the last several years. You can read your bio, which is quite extensive as a scholar practitioner, as an author, as, as a scholar. A lot of the work that Patricia has done in the field um, of uh, mental health, particularly immigrant mental health and women's leadership in STEM and multicultural competency development. You've had a wide ranging career and I think it's just a delight to have you here today. Uh, in addition, I also just wanna thank you for the work that you continue to do for fielding as well. You've really been uh, participating in the life of our community and I, I, much, I so appreciate that. So I also wanna introduce Rosa Zubizarreta who is a doctoral student at Fielding, uh, but like many of our doctoral students, uh, she has come from a long and varied background in a, in a lot of uh, areas, including uh, systems and being ca uh, looking at catalysts for effective social action. Also an author, you can see in her bio, from Conflict to Creative Collaboration, a user's guide to dynamic facilitation. So, uh, Rosa, it seems like you're a perfect fielding student and you've come to the right community because it's exactly the kind of work that we're interested in and curious about. So we want to see if, uh, want to say hello. Thank you. 
Katrina. Um, thank you, Placida. Thank you, Akasha. Thank you, everybody who's been organizing this. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, muy feliz de estar aquí con todos ustedes. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the program today. Great, great. Thanks for being here, Rosa. And then Tomas Leal, our fielding trustee, who I've come to know in that role, uh, most recently Senior Director of Global Inclusion uh, at Glasgow Smith Klein or GSK, but also Tomas, just knowing, um, getting to know you the past few years, I've learned a lot about your work and I know you've worked in university settings as well as in many companies and always around your hearth and home, which has been diversity and inclusion. So say hello, Tomas. That's going to be the most difficult thing I do is unmute. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me to be part of the panel. This is um, really a, uh, I believe, a very important conversation that uh, I know most of us have uh, started very early in our careers and in our journey. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for being here. And then Sonia Tinoco is a graduate program advisor at Fielding, and I've gotten to know Sonia through her work as the vice chair of Fielding Staff Council and also now a member of the Inclusion Council. Uh, I also see her around the kitchen every week when I'm in town, and it's uh, always a pleasure to have you on board as the staff. I, I think um, Sonia's particular perspective as a licensed MFD and her master's degree in clinical psychology, she brings that work into her own work at Fielding and really appreciate having you with us today, Sonia. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Katrina. Um, uh, I am really just super excited to be a part, to have the opportunity to be a part of this panel discussion. I know that I am a little bit younger than most of the, the panel, and so I bring a different perspective, um, but I at the same time feel that it's a a valuable perspective, um, especially given our social climate at this time. And so I'm very, again, excited to be here and to discuss the movie and just bring some, some insight and excitement. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Sonia. It's a pleasure. And then Placida Gallegos, I wanted to introduce you last. Everyone knows who you are, of course, but I often think about how you and I were hired the same year at Fielding. I think you started a little bit before I did, and you've been a colleague um, in the faculty in human and organization development, and also a lot of the work that you've done, not just with graduate students, but also outside as an organization development consultant. I think you're bringing all of that experience to bear on your current role, and it's wonderful to see that. So I appreciate you being here today and always being just a solid, solid leader in these spaces and more. And I'm going to turn it over to you after you say hello. Good. Good. Thank you, Katrina. Um, did we miss Gloria? Did Yes, did and we? I just okay. posted so, her Gloria. Well, value. yeah, well, I, just, yes. I can introduce Gloria myself Please. because she, <laughs> her work around um, especially Latinas and um, coming into uh, community colleges, especially community college leadership and her wonderful dissertation, Si Se Puede, which is It Can Be Done and how these women overcame so many barriers. And she's now even uh, supervising graduate students and on the faculty at Grand Canyon. Is that right? And um, welcome, Gloria. Glad you could be with us. Welcome, Gloria. My apologies for oh. not realizing you're on the panel. That's <laughs> Thank you. No problem. No problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this panel discussion today and, and working at Grand Canyon with doctoral learners. Um, it's an inspiration that I'm able to use my, my doctoral degree and help others achieve their dream as well. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Cool. Good. Okay. Well, um, so I just want to sort of frame up a bit of what we're talking about and then we'll show the video and then we'll come back in and hear from the rest of us uh, from everyone. But it just struck me um, uh, that people in terms of orientation. So so the the month is called Hispanic Awareness Month and Hispanic, the term itself uh, has somewhat gone out of favor as being more conservative. Um, and so it kind of represents uh, uh, historically kind of like my father would consider himself a Hispanic. So that meant more associated with the Spanish part in some ways than the, than the mixed part. Um, and so over the years, the names continue to change. And I think it's really an important part of any group that 
we get to name ourselves. It's kind of the ultimate empowerment that we get to decide uh, what we're called. And because the times change, then the names change and they will continue to change. And so people you know, tend to kind of minimize that and say, oh, it's just political correctness. Why don't they just settle on something and stop all this? But to really understand that it's not a, an insignificant thing. Um, because the term Hispanic actually came out of the federal government, the Census Bureau decided we need a name to call all these <laughs> very diverse people uh, and made up that name. So later on, as the, um, in particular, the Chicano movement here in the US you know, uh, evolved, they said, well, we don't wanna be called something that the government named us. Um, and it's his panic, not our panic, uh, was <laughs> kind of the way it used to be said. Um, and so the, you know, the term Latino became more of a self-naming, you know, this is what we call ourselves. Um, and then within that category of Latino, there are over 22 different countries represented, you know, people from all different countries, all who generally share the Spanish language. So ha coming from a Spanish language uh, background, uh, but you know, again, it's you're you're combining a very very diverse group uh, under the umbrella of of Hispanic, which now has become Latino, um, and so it's it's an important case of sort of looking at at both and the similarities and their differences within the Latino community, and so we're both. Um, I think there are some common denominators across all those people from all those 22 different countries. Um, for example, just being family oriented, I think, you know, family and not just immediate family, but extended family really matters a lot and coming from a collectivist culture matters. Uh, we're very passionate, very emotional, very expressive. Um, and I think that again is across the board, all those different types of, of Latinos and, and a concept of respect. There's a notion that of, of el respeto, which means that you're seeing that human beings are seen to deserve respect regardless of your actions. So you start with the assumption that everybody should be respected versus the notion in, um, in US culture that's more of a, um, you earn my respect, right? And, and so the notion of el respeto is that because you're a human being on the planet, you deserve respect. And so there are different ways that the, the culture gets played out. But I think there are, of course, wonderful things about our culture um, and I think, so just to kind of understand how that's evolved. And so Latinx is the latest iteration of naming that is emerging from more from current generations of, of people um, who also want to get away from the gender binary of Latina, Latino. Um, and as someone, I'm sure Patricia can identify with this as well as Gloria, at the same time, uh, there are real issues between Latinas and Latinos and that Latinas uh, needs as, as women um, are complicated. And so one of the concerns I have about the Latinx move is that it sort of X's out those differences, right? We're just all uh, a, a group. So I think it's a both and to sort of hold the pan-ethnic sort of idea of Latinx and it being a much more sort of current progressive term. But at the same time, I think the importance of, of recognizing gender differences within that. Um, and so it's all, I think to me, it's all sort of uh, additive, you know, that we come to understand uh, these issues, uh, you know, as they evolve. Um, and so the, in terms of the, this particular video that we're going to see, and it's called the Chicano Martyrs, uh, 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 and what I loved about it just personally is that my family and my uh, ancestors uh, came from the New Mexico, Colorado area, uh, which was uh, which was Mexico, and half the U.S. was Mexico at one time. That most people don't understand, and so my ancestors have always been in that area. So we didn't uh, immigrate from anywhere. We've been there for many hundreds of years, and so uh, so the idea of ch the Chicano movement kind of emerged from Mexican Americans uh, uh, in general across the country who wanted to have a, a more political statement that says, "Yes, we're Mexican American, but there's an activism." orientation associated with that that is about empowering other, you know, other Lat Latinos and other Chicanos. So the Chicano movement, which emerged late 60s, early 70s, uh, was, was really an awakening for most of us. And many of us at least were, were in high school and college at that time. And, and so when I saw this particular movie, it, it is about the a snapshot of the particular um, population, subpopulation among the Latino community that was northern New Mexico, southern Colorado in particular. And so since I grew up in that area, so it was very familiar to me. It was kind of like the place of, from which my particular strand of, of Latino identity um, came from. So I want to show that as 
kind of the importance of place, which I know that the others on the panel can speak to, because we grew up in different parts of the country with different sort of ethnic and different um, you know, representations. We all share this, this umbrella, but I think have different associations, both to our, our Latino, Latinx identity, as well as our connection to, to the social movements of the time. And so uh, after the, we watch the video, then you know, we'll talk briefly about how, those, how we were connected to the movements of those times. And then what we see is kind of the contrast between then and now, you know, because I think there is a renewed activism, which for most of us is very exciting to see how activism is now re-emerging re and just in time given the kind of uh, conservative repression that we've got going on um, nationally. Um, so asking the panelists to sort of think about then and now, given what was going on then, what are some similarities and then what are some differences that we notice um, as we pull that through. So, um, so yeah, so with that, I would just say that, you know, literally the, when I saw this movie, it was like, you could see me in the crowd there. I mean, it was like, I was at those places with those people. Um, and also some of my friends were some of the people that were killed as part of uh, the, the repression that was going on and the police brutality and all the kinds of things that were happening at that time. And um, so it's, uh, it's very bittersweet to look back and see how far we've come and how far we haven't come, uh, given, I think, the current anti-Latino, anti-immigrant um, sentiment here in the country. So one thing is a common pull through <laughs> that Latinos have, uh, have been undervalued, underrepresented, and marginalized, and that continues to be the case, including at Fielding. So I would say that. So let's go ahead and watch the, we're going to watch about a 12-minute clip of this, and, and then we'll have our conversation. Yes, and reminding everyone to put your video on mute. And for those of us who have joined us on the phone, please stay on. I mean, the narration is, is really good and you'll be able to join in the experience as well as the discussion afterwards. Okay. I can't hear it, Akasha. Sorry, that's because I put myself on mute. Shouldn't okay. have done that. I'm following my own rules. See? Good thing. Akari has a good parent. It is said in progressive Can you all hear it now? Revolutionary movements. Yes. Good. Thanks. The character of a movement by its martyrs. Let us die fighting in the barrios, in the jails, in the college campuses, in the fields, in the streets, for our ras. Let us all be organizers in every day of our lives. Chicano! Chicano! This is a commemoration for the fallen heroes that gave and gave and gave till it cost them their lives. They are not dead. They are here in every one of you. Everyone here is Ricardo. Everyone here is one of the seas. The intense repression faced by mass movements for social justice, such as the Chicano movement of the 1960s and 70s, led to the imprisonment and death of activists. Some of these courageous sacrifices are well known. Less well known are the martyrs of the Chicano movement, 40 years after nine young Chicano activists were martyred in Colorado. Over 600 people gathered for a historic event in Denver to commemorate their legacy. What would Los Ays de Boulder and these other young people that died, what would their lives have been like? What contributions could they have made had they lived? The contradictions in the society during the time of the Vietnam War reached a peak, and that is right when these killings happened. The state underestimates the power of history, and history rarely stays put in a forgotten, disconnected past. And that is the door that we have opened today. Que viva la raza! <laughs> In thinking about the experiences that led up to the Chicano movement in the 1960s, the evolution of, of popular struggle, political struggle, 
I think the, the communities were in search of identity. They were in search of, of a place that they could historically claim. The Chicano movement gave us an option. It gave us a different perspective and a different way to dedicate ourselves. We had experienced colonialism. We had experienced the idea that we had been expulsed from the land, that we had, many of us had lost the language. We didn't understand this, that this was part of, the, of a system of oppression. They don't teach you an alternative history, they just teach you the straightforward American version of American history, right? We knew there had been a war against Mexico, but we didn't understand that that war involved us. What was really passionate for all of us was the knowledge that we were colonized people. This deeply penetrating prejudice fed us the notion that we were less than, and we were certainly set apart. And that came through in the neighborhoods and in the schools in various ways. Everybody was fed up. We had reached a point where there was, uh, there was no turning back, really, because we had never accomplished anything. We were at the bottom of every aspect of society, economically, educationally, every aspect. We were at the very bottom. And so we decided, okay, we're going to have to fight back, and we're going to have to start showing that we can become a power within the society. Calling oneself Chicano or Chicana recognized a connection to indigenous history and became a way to express a newfound pride in a shared cultural, ethnic, and community identity. You know, my roots are in northern New Mexico, and in northern New Mexico, there has always been in my lifetime talk about land and talk about what happened. Coming from the San Luis Valley, and my parents always believing that in the land and being farm workers. My grandfather used to always start every story with cuando la tierra era de, de nosotros, when this land was our land. Every story he ever told us. And growing up, I never understood that. But in the 1960s, when I became part of the Chicano movement, I reflected on that and I said, oh my God, now I know what he meant. The land was stolen. We are, as Chicanos, we recognize that we have been on this land for hundreds of years. The Spanish came and conquered the natives. We are the natives. So now, being uh, mestizos, or mestiza, we have the indigenous blood. We have the European blood. We have connection to the continent. We have been here. This is our home land. And we began to search for our ancestors and who were they. And that led us back to the indigenous periods, the indigenous times of Mexico. People had been living in what today is called Central America, Mexico, and the Southwest for thousands of years before European conquest. Indigenous peoples created highly organized civilizations, such as the Olmec, Maya, Toltec, Aztec, and Teotihuacan that had robust systems of trade, artistic production, architecture, agriculture, as well as writing systems and calendars. So to have someone now come forward and say, you're indigenous, you are uh, descendants of great people, the Mexica tribes, that was incredible. And it gave us pride for the first time. That was what was so burning. And that's what gave the movement, if you will, the personality or the identity that it had. And we were indignant. We were pissed off that we were lied to, cheated out of our lands, that our families had gone through so much prejudice. We were angry, damn it. And we were gonna to go to the university and get our education and go back and make a change. That's what we were there for. And, and that's what held us all together. And then in that process, we studied and organized and studied and organized. Our hard reality is that standing against injustice in the schools, in the fields, the courts, and the streets do not come without sacrifice. And for those who made the greatest sacrifices, those imprisoned 
terrorized or killed, we will always remember that the advancement of our people was because of you. And there were a lot of formations in the Chicano movement. The Chicano movement wasn't monolithic. There were a lot of different formations in it. Pierina on the land question in New Mexico, Cesar Chavez and, and the unionizing of the campesinos in, in California. And, and uh, a little later on, the development of Raza Unida, Jose Angel Gutierrez and all these people. In Northern Colorado, you had brown berets, uh, black berets that began to say, we have been expulsed from high schools. The push out rate was probably 60 to 68 percent. And these kids started saying, we want to be responsible for the kinds of education that we think should be taught. We need to have our history taught, our culture taught. And so there was this activism across the Southwest for Chicano studies, for Mexican American studies. In Colorado, you had the Crusade for Justice and they built an urban movement, a youth movement that was based on the social conditions of what was going on in the Chicano communities in Denver. Emulating a lot of our movement after the Black Panthers and the Black Liberation Movement. And that's how we started uh, dealing with the questions of the schools and dealing with the question of uh, uh, in inequalities in all aspects of society and trying to develop a consciousness. I really understood the Black Liberation Movement, the Native American Movement, the Puerto Rican Independence Movement, and all the world, that it was a worldwide movement. It wasn't just us. Speak with purpose. For you have a mouth full of arrows. You have the spine of a volcano. You are my fountain. You are my Anacaona with a spear in hand, a rose for a tongue, this. As I defend our loved ones, you are the Pope. Born out of the ashes of Tenochtitlan, so spit fire, right fire, for it has been said that the dry grass was set fire to the whole forest, so beat the drum in your throat, put flames at my feet, and I will follow behind. What really sparked the Chicano movement was uh, the whole question of police crimes in our community. You know, in, in Colorado, it was uh, a young man that was uh, killed by the Denver police, uh, beating to death and at the Cowboy Inn in East Denver. And they gave him a real bad beating and killed him. And going to autopsies for young boys, men who had been killed by police. I hated an autopsy. It was always the same result because the, the, the first one who got the official autopsy was the police. And then we'd get second by the time we'd, I mean, I'd see the, you know, they'd cut them up, cut the, the breastbone and pull out the guts and cut from the back of the head. And I, I just, uh, I got sick and tired of going to autopsies. And it didn't matter, the kid was dead. He got killed by a cop, there was no, <laughs> with that there was no doubt. Shortly thereafter, they killed another young man in West Denver. Uh, they attributed his death to the fact that he had an unusually thin skull. And they crushed his skull with the clubs when they beat him. So those are the things that inspired us and kind of woke us up to say, well, what the heck is going on? Who's going to do something about this? And it was an occurrence that was happening not only in Colorado, but in California and Texas and New Mexico and Arizona, wherever we were. That's what sparked us in Colorado, and that's where we started. And, and we started, uh, I guess, in a sense, to fight back. They say that those who die in the struggle for other people live on forever in the immortality of their lives. The song is called Broken Hope. Many times in life, it seems happy now really be. My brother Junior was a young man that was killed in, in a shootout with the Denver Police Department in 1973. We believe it, it was a direct response to his leadership and his activism with the Crusade for Justice at that time. The Crusade for Justice rose to national prominence in the late 1960s and 70s as a result of their work in Chicano communities confronting police brutality, 
opposing the war in Vietnam and cultivating youth empowerment. The crusade created numerous institutions, including a community school called Escuela Tlatelolco, and also developed housing for teachers and organizers. My brother Junior, he Okay, welcome back. Hmm. Yeah, wow. So, yes. Um, so in thinking about, you know, being taken back in time to, the, to that uh, period, and I was struck by the, a number of things, but one being the, the whole notion of awakening, and that certainly is what the Chicano movement was for me at that time, because I had always been very aware of the unfair treatment and racism, but I didn't, I was, I was young and I didn't know what it was. I was always confused by it when I'd encounter racism at school or other. I was like, what, what is that? You know, my, my little white friend says she can't play with me because I'm Mexican. And I'm like, what is what? <laughs> you know, so as a child, you're just confused by these things. And so when I was in high school and the Chicano movement came up, it was like, oh, suddenly things fell into place that had been sort of the experience of racism that my father had experienced in our family and historically. So this notion of awakening you know, was really what it was and ha being able to put a systemic frame around it and saying, uh, you know, we were colonized, the history has been kept from us and how do we organize? So, so that was the, the, the process. And so I'm struck by the fact that now people are talking about being woke, right? That woke is the thing. Uh, and, and so there's always been a sense of awakening, but it, you know, it's kind of, what does that mean now in today's context? Um, and I also think about the notion of transformation. We talk about transformational learning and uh, and again, for me and for many of us at the time, it was like a total reframing of our mindsets because suddenly from being oppressed, we were uh, connected to kings and, uh, and a, a rich history and we were not uh, the bottom of the barrel in the ways that we had been treated in, in the U.S. And so I think it was that, that sense of, uh, of empowerment uh, that came with that and, and a lot of excitement and a, a sense of, uh, of self that emerged. Um, and then I think how that has, I mean, some of what you see on the film in terms of some of the murders and the martyrs and there were bombings and there were, you know, that there were, we found later that there was very active uh, repression on the part of the CIA and the FBI, you know, to infiltrate these movements and to destroy them. And so there was a very active effort to shut down uh, all that you saw started there. And I think it was very fairly successful because they they killed off some leaders and then some of us you know kind of got went into education so that idea that education was the way out um, and then many of us continued on and moved in and you know became professors and uh, and board members you know so you know so we're we have moved into positions of, of relative power and authority um, and yet many of the issues are still are still there and um, so we're not necessarily marching on the streets because hopefully we're more at the table uh, and willing to make you know contributions but many of the issues have not have not changed so um, so I'll start with that and uh, want to invite in others I wanted to hear from see if Sonia wanted to go next to kind of represent the other end of the spectrum of <laughs> of our diversity given that so that Sonia wasn't alive when <laughs> this happened, but it still touched her a lot. So welcome, Sonia. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's interesting because as you say, you know, I wasn't alive during this time, but I feel that it was such a powerful movement and really helped to, I think, develop and influence who my father was. And ultimately, I was um, raised by him. He was a single dad. And so really was able to influence me and my passion for wanting to make a difference in the world, wanting to make a difference for, you know, a movement of the people. That's one of the things I kind of always remember. I remember growing up with um, the, the union flag, you know, Cesar Chavez, that movement, that flag was in our um, garage. So coming in, you know, every day seeing that my dad was also very much, I know that, um, different but similar, very much influenced by Bob Marley and his movement, you know, One Love. And so it's really amazing to me, you know, after watching this, I often kind of, I put myself in that place and, and at that time. Um, and, you know, how would it have been for me? How was it for my father? How was it for my grandfather who came to the United States as a bracero, um, you know, and the struggle and the fight. And, and as you said, you know, the the movement, there's been a lot of, I think, change and a lot of progress. 
However, I think that there's still so much more to be done. And I loved how you talked about, you know, we're not on the streets uh, marching, but we're at the table. And I think that that's so powerful in terms of how do we move forward and creating, creating a future that is, is brighter and will provide ultimately greater opportunity for um, my generation, for my, my siblings who are younger, and for my future generation, for my children, for my grandchildren. Um, and so that's for me when I was watching this movie, there were so many emotions that um, came up for me. There was feelings of disgust, like, you know, why is this not spoken? Why, why are we not taught our future, um, our history, excuse me? Um, there are emotions of anger and, and excitement and, and like, okay, well, how do I take this movement, all of the, the, this power that was created and now bring it into today's um, settings. And so uh, that for me, you know, and I love the fact that Fielding has provided this space for us to have this conversation to see like, well, what can I take from this and how can I contribute to the greater good of, of my people um, and, and for all people really. And, and, and so that's really exciting for me. Thanks, Sonia. Yeah. And just to clarify, we think being on the streets is very important. So the fact that people need to be both still on the streets marching, but I think one of the things uh, that we need to focus on as much is voting, right? Because we still are not voting in our numbers. And so we can make the most difference now. So very good. Thank you. Uh, Tomas, would you like to go next? Please. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm uh, one of the Tejanos from the group. I grew up in Texas, in the uh, Texas-Mexican border, Brownsville, Texas. Uh, you know, like Placida uh, shared, a pretty large extended family, very uh, Roman Catholic uh, values around education, and a very strong value centered around familia, family. Uh, I grew up with 43 first cousins, uh, we all lived within an eight block radius of my maternal grandmother, uh, Doña Gertrudes, who basically ruled uh, the family in a way that was both very nurturing, but also very strong. And, and, and in a, she was a businesswoman uh, in my hometown. She owned tortilla factories, tortillerias in Brownsville, Texas. So um, this was sort of where my sort of uh, awareness of being Mexicano, is what we were using then, Mexicanismo, was really important. We were bilingual, we were bicultural, and because we lived on the border, we had that fluidity between Mexico and Texas and, and the U.S. I visited my mother's side of the family. It was from Mexico originally. My dad, like uh, Placida, the, 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 the Leal family had been in Tex South Texas for generations, so uh, I always say the border came to us. We did not cross the border. So it's, it's you know, we had dairy farms uh, in South Texas. Uh, so my firsthand experience, uh, really, in education with the Chicano movement was when I enrolled at the University of Texas at Austin in 1972. Uh, and it was my first experience with really, I mean, I had experiences of being different growing up through school and, and stuff, but I, you know, I was in a community in my hometown where we were about 90% Mexican, Mexican American. Uh, so going to UT Austin, uh, one of the things that I remember, two things I remember very quickly was, I, had, I was in my dorm room, I was real, I had a roommate, I had my memo board on the, on the dorm room, and I remember coming home from class one day and uh, the, written on my memo board was, Spick, go home. I didn't even know what spick meant at that time. So I, I called my dad. I was like, dad, what does spick mean? And he was like, why? And when I relayed the story, it took everything in my power to, not, to convince him not to come up and get me and bring me back home. Uh, because he was just really disturbed, of course, that, that this was written on my board. A second, and we saw it in the film, a second incident was with a, a bunch of friends we went to a smaller city in South, in around Austin that's uh, more German heritage. And in the, um, on the door of the restaurant was a sign that said, please, no dogs and no Mexican. And when I said to my friends who were mostly white, because it was my dorm mates, 
uh, I said, well, I can't go in there. And they said, why not? I, I was what, 18 at the time. I can't go in there. I'm Mexican. They said, oh, they're not talking about you. They're talking about all those migrant families that bring 10, 12 kids and they leave a mess. And I'm like, well, you're actually talking about my mother's side of the family who migrated from Mexico to Dallas, Texas as migrant workers in the communities around Dallas. So those are the first things that sort of awakened me to this, this, this movement that we were calling the Chicano movement. Um, I, I was, you know, real quickly, I was involved in the Mexican American Youth Organization, which was, I think, the precursor to Mecha, the Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Atzlan, uh, very active in that organization. But the, re the group that really enlightened me and really was extremely fulfilling, and I felt a real part of the movement, was Teatro Chicano. Uh, I was part of the Teatro Campesino movement that uh, playwright uh, Luis Valdez, uh, he wrote a lot of actos or plays that educated our farm worker communities as well as community activists around the issues of colonialism, of taking power uh, in our own hands and really creating uh, Atzlan, which was the Southwest, and kind of reclaiming that land back uh, for us. So I, I was uh, a member of the Teatro Chicano, uh, did my bit in acting, but it wasn't really about acting. It was about really relaying a message. So, I mean, those are the, the things that started my journey. I was part of the Chicano Studies uh, a curriculum at the University of Texas, uh, where I learned about Chicano politics, uh, Chicano poetry, and Chicano literature, which was really an amazing journey for me. Uh, and and it's, it started my journey uh, in the inclusion, equity, and diversity work and social justice work that, I'm, that I've been involved in since then. Uh, as uh, Katrina mentioned, not only in higher education, where I spent a few years in student affairs, student life, and student development, but also in the private sector and in the nonprofit sector. Uh, it has really, I think, catapulted me into the work that I do that I'm so passionate about and that it really uh, was, again, uh, yes, being out on the streets is important, but also at the table and really creating those in, uh, very important dialogues around, you know, what, what is this all about and how are we going to create uh, change in a meaningful way, in a way that's productive. So I'll stop there. Uh, don't want to take too much time. But thank you, though. Yeah. And I think your point that how, and, and the film demonstrates it, but how, how much going to university was so much a part of the movement. It was very much focused on students and student activism. And so the fact that now as part of fielding, right, we're the, also in, in the, as education is a doorway through and a doorway, which I'm sure all of our families said, get an education, get an education. That's the way. Um, and here we are, wherever we are. <laughs> Thank you, Tomas. Uh, Thank you. Glor Gloria, you want to go ahead and check in? Dr. Gutierrez. Okay, I was trying to unmute myself. My journey was a little different as um, my grandparents all came from Mexico and were migrant farm workers. Um, and, uh, and, and then my, my father um, was very, very interested in being um, assimilated into the American culture. And so he was almost in denial of being Mexican. And it, so as a child, I, I had a, an experience similar to yours, Placida, where I was in elementary school and all of a sudden someone came up to me, pulled my hair and called me a dirty Mexican. I went home to my mom and I said, well, what, what's a Mexican and why am I dirty? Because <laughs> you know, I did, had no idea what that meant. and. And so that was the first time, I think I was six years old at the time. So that's the first time that somebody, you know, called out to me that I was different. And then I started noticing color difference. And, and, um, and, and so I started becoming aware of that. And it wasn't until, um, so, you know, when these, the Chicano movement was happening, I was very, very young. And, and, and in retrospect, I can see, you know, my father was working so hard at assimilating that when we were in family gatherings, most of my family, I grew up in Riverside, California. So when we, my mom and dad and my mom, my dad both had large families. So family gatherings in California, there was a lot of discussion about 
um, familia and and my dad was always saying, you know, if you want to claim Mexico, you go back to Mexico. But like, we're Americans, so blah, blah, blah. So he was really, in many respects, trying to be white and be assimilated because that's what he thought you needed to do. Where other relatives felt like, no, you can maintain your Latino heritage and your Mexican-American heritage and be proud of that as well. So I remember those conversations now and and... I think just as a child, you want, you tend to go follow your parents' example. And it really wasn't until I was an undergraduate and started taking Mexican um, folk dance. And I started seeing the beauty of my own heritage and then started studying Aztec thought and culture that I really gained an appreciation. It's like, oh, there is something beautiful about my own Mexican heritage. And then actually coming to fielding and really dealing with some beautiful thoughts and and grappling with you know being you know a latina and being mexican and and understanding this colonialism concept and recognizing what i had lived through and and then reflecting back um that i recognize um what my father was doing was trying to survive and make sure that we all survived in this society. So what I had been ashamed of most of my life, really I have come to recognize is really something to take pride in. So, um, and then also marrying a Latino from New Mexico as Plasta is, understanding that all of these, uh, California, New Mexico, <laughs> You know, the border, they didn't cross the border, the border crossed them. And this whole concept of being colonized is huge. And then there's so much in our heritage to be proud of. Uh, as mestizos, mestizas, and the research I've done. And then, you know, as, as Chicanos, Chicanas, wanting to learn our own history and being deprived of that has been a huge, it's been a huge um, disservice to our children and to all of us. And I think a companion um, video, Lasida, to this one is the precious knowledge video that I we shared at Fielding. I think that's a, a good follow up to this one because it does talk about that, you know, sharing of the history that you know Chicanos need, you know, the kids need, and that they tried to do here in Arizona. And I know, I think Anna's familiar with it and some other people on this call are also familiar with that movement here in Arizona. So, um, and in my work, I, I want to do more, but I know that even in my work at the university, I'm a role model. You know, when students see me in the front of the classroom, they're like, oh my gosh, you're the first Latino professor I've met. You know, and that's, I'm so excited, you know, to have a minute to talk with you. So it's, yeah, this is why I, I earned my PhD, you know, to be able to work with these students. So I'm, I'm excited and thrilled. So doing this work and, and wanting to help other Latinos succeed is important, but it's like, I'm only one person. So I want to be part of more people and helping, you know, other Chicanos be successful. Thanks, Gloria. Yeah. And really to understand that your parents, our parents were, were responding to a very racist environment, right? So I know when, our, when my siblings went to school, they would be punished for speaking Spanish. So they weren't allowed to speak Spanish and had to speak English or be punished. So the parents were you know, kind of responding to those circumstances in terms of assimilation being a strategy, but uh, we found out That's the limits true. of it. <laughs> yeah. That's true. My mom, was, my mom grew up in Texas and she was, she was punished for speaking English. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, for speaking Spanish, sorry. There you go, good. All right, um, Patricia, please. You're on mute. Well, yes, I, I am muted, thank you. Uh, you know, the uh, presentations thus far do, do talk a lot about place and how place matters as far as, um, in my case, my Mexican-American identity, uh, because I'm not from the Southwest. And I grew up pretty much in an immigrant community in uh, Northern Ohio, near Cleveland. 
So Mexicans or people of Mexican and Puerto Rican heritage, those were the largest um, Latino groups, um, were the ones that probably defined what it meant uh, in our own way uh, to be different. And, but I was very aware of being in an immigrant group. So I, I would say that there was uh, a way that maybe some marginalization occurred, but I went to a, a Catholic school where we were the only Mexican American family. And uh, immediately, I, I think what made a difference was as long as you were smart, um, the nuns supported you. And so my path and my siblings path through Catholic school, uh, grade up until grade eighth, was one of um, inclusion. I think they were kind of nasty to the boys, but not to the girls, as long as you were smart. And um, But I was aware of color um, because I went to a school that was Eastern European. So uh, I'm, I'm dark hair. And, um, and so my classmates were primarily uh, white and blonde. And um, But again, the the actual discrimination wasn't um, uh, like Tomas had described, for example, in South Texas. Um, I know that there was because there weren't any teachers, there weren't any police officers um, that were uh, of Mexican heritage, and they had uh, Mexicans had been there a long time. So my um, I'm Mexican on both sides of my family. My dad was an immigrant um, from Central um, Mexico from. Guanajuato, and my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, uh, was from Oaxaca. And uh, so I learned a lot from her, and I'll just comment in brief in terms of why it's important to be conscious of our, our history and the role models within our own family. Uh, my mom was born in the States, but I, you know, I was shaped as a person of Mexican heritage from both my parents and my grandmother. And, and that meant early on participating in Mexican events, Mexican activities. Um, there was a community that my father and my uncle were part of in founding a Mexican mutual society that is now celebrating its 90th anniversary. And my, one of my brothers is the president of the organization. So we have a history in, in that town of being leaders as Arredondos in that, in that community. Um, and most of my family is still there. I mean, I, my siblings, my, you know, all of us in terms of kids are gone, ne nieces and nephews with a couple exceptions. But there's a great pride my parents instilled in us about being Mexican. So we learned the dances when we were kids. We learned the Mexican um, national anthem. <laughs> I mean, we learned all the songs. And uh, we were performing fiestas as kids. So that sense of cultural or, or ethnic identity was very strong. And it, it did lead me to study Spanish um, as a major in, at the university and um, become a Spanish teacher. And where I think Gloria mentioned, you know, again, uh, increasing uh, awareness of the history. Uh, you know, I have family history and so forth, but the and books around the house that my father had. But I think pride in the legacy of what came from Mexico and the mestiza identity, as Gloria mentioned, you know, that we are biracial people. Uh, my grandmother was from Oaxaca, so she is, in fact, very Indian. She was very in Zapoteca. And so, you know, if you, you walk around, um, you know, uh, Oaxaca, you'll see my grandmother in terms of, of that kind of visual identity of, of being indigenous. And, and, and I, what I would say in terms of, of that early shaping, because that really, my consciousness about being Mexican has always been uh, at the foremost of my identity. Um, and sometimes I don't even mention it because I think it's so integrated in who I am. Um, However, with, with role models, as, as I think um, all of you have mentioned, um, in, in my grandmother was, um, again, uh, ran away from home to not get married, and so she ended up um, marrying my grandfather along the way. But she, after he died, um, she uh, went to work at the steel mill where my dad worked and bought her first home. And so she became a businesswoman too, Tomas. So she bought a boarding house. She bought a house, made it a boarding house for other, for immigrant men 
who could live there. She cooked their meals, she did their laundry, and she worked and um, took care of some of her grandchildren as well. Uh, when Urban Renewal came in, um, they paid her for the house and she went on and bought another house. So, I mean, that's the kind of legacy I, I have and, and I think my siblings have with my grandmother who just was uh, illiterate, uh, spoke English marginally, uh, but had las ganas, as we say, the desire to, uh, to go on and to self-empower. I mean, she was just an amazing woman. Um, and then my parents, again, instilling my Mexican identity. My dad was one of these people who crossed over in the sense of he was very active in white um, sports organizations um, that he introduced all of us to as kids. So we, um, we spoke Spanish at home. Um, I grew up bilingual and um, I have, you know, so much regard for um, what they gave us as, as children and as now grandchildren. And I, you know, I, I, I know that that continues to influence the work I do. Um, my work on uh, immigrants for years has been, com comes out of growing up in an immigrant community, not just Mexican, but other immigrants and how people managed. Um, but I think my focus on the Latina experience is one that is sort of where I, I am putting more emphasis now. I've done a lot in, uh, in Latinx mental health and um, organizational leadership, the focus on diversity in organizations. But I think we have a, an empowered group of Latinas that are still not making it in the ranks of higher education leadership. And that's where I think we have to, where I'm working on now is looking at the kind of leadership Latinas actually engage in and enact that really looks like what are considered the, the prototype leadership models of resonant leadership and so forth, using our emotional intelligence to lead. So uh, I would say that I'm, I'm super conscious of the kind of legacy I, I want to leave, um, like others about being a role model. I spoke to a clinical, uh, a fielding clinical student last week who said she looked me up, okay, and, and I met her at APA, uh, but she looked me up in, in terms of my bio, and she said she had never met someone like me, just mm -hmm. like people have told Gloria. So I, I, I know we have an important role to play, especially in graduate education because we are shaping people who can go out and influence and, and lead the way because, you know, I, I've got time, but I, I'm just saying we need to have other, the, the next couple of generations um, to follow and create their new pathways for us. So I'm, I'm very excited about this conversation and um, know that it's very meaningful to me, uh, and I'm hoping that if there's an opportunity to create greater consciousness, uh, uh, just even among uh, Latinx students, faculty, and staff at Fielding, that's going to be an important contribution, and then again to the community at large. So uh, one last thing, as I said, I'm in Mexico City, and um, I've never been here for the celebration of Independence Day. And, and I'm just very uh, awed by the enormous energy around independence here. And I mean, I grew up, I'm, I'm born in the States, grew up in the States, and you know, we have the 4th of July parades and so forth. This is kind of a, a scale that I've never seen. <laughs> and um, so uh, talking about a military parade, uh, that I witnessed this morning. <laughs> tell you, nothing like it I've ever seen in the States. So, and I, I don't think we will. It's just different. Uh, so I'm very honored and, and uh, to be part of this work. Thank you. Gracias. Thanks, Patricia. And as we as we know, we probably we need two hours or two days for this conversation. So I'm aware of the shortness of time, and yet we still want to make sure and get everybody in. So please, Rosa. Yes, thank you so much, Placida. Um, yeah, uh, I really appreciate many of the themes that have come up, even just the 
Latinx, yeah. Latino, Latina, Chicano, people connecting here at Fielding. Um, that feels like um, new and, and powerful and, and good. And I'm really looking forward to the ripple effects also outward. Um, I'm, um, I'm not Mexican. <laughs> So just want to acknowledge that. Um, I was born in Peru, in South America. My father is, is peruano, um, and my mother is Cuban, and they met in Spain. And I um, came to the States with them when I was eight. So I'm an immigrant, even though I had the, the privilege of coming here with a visa and applying for green cards and getting green cards and all that. So. I'm really aware that the situation of people who come here as, as immigrants is often much more ch challenging. At the same time, I also uh, had very, very similar experiences of having, you know, a little girl come up to me and tell me that she had been told that she couldn't play with me. And um, we were the only Spanish speaking family in a very white suburb in Atlanta at the time. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was not yet an international multiracial city at that point, the way it is now. So it was a, some pretty strong experiences of um, exclusion. And I went through being a high school kid and wanting to assimilate and having my mom fight really hard to have us speak Spanish at home because she um, had gotten very involved with bilingual education from the beginning. And so along those lines, uh, people are talking about the Chicano movement and, the, influ and the, the emphasis on education and all that. And that just made me think of how, you know, 1968, Title VII was passed, which um, allowed for bilingual education uh, in this country. And in 1974, Lau versus Nichols was a Supreme Court case um, that actually involved Chinese uh, kids who the Supreme Court did, did determined we're not getting an equal educational opportunity because they were not being taught in a language that they could understand. And so uh, my mom had gotten very involved in bilingual education and I ended up being a bilingual classroom teacher in California for four years. Um, but then, you know, eventually I, I had already started to um, become very interested in, um, in finding my own path and in starting to work with, with org change and all that. But, um, you know, we had Proposition 227 in 1998, which outlawed, you know, so there's these pendulum swings, which outlawed uh, bilingual programs in California that was followed by other types of, uh, of similar efforts in Arizona and in, uh, in Massachusetts, where for a time there was English only. And then, you know, almost 20 years after 2016, we have Proposition 58 passed in California again. And so kind of the theme of then and now, um, I think part of what's happened is that there are a lot more people of Latino background in California now, both people who, whose families have been there since forever, since it was part of Mexico and stressed out of being part of the U.S., and also the people who keep who keep coming. And one of the things I wanted to say, I really appreciated the list, Placida, at the beginning of the, the things that we have in common, you know, family and being part of collectivist cultures and expressiveness and respect. And I wanted to add one more thing to it because I think that whether we are Chicanos here in the States who, whose land was taken um, and, you know, the border crossed you, you didn't cross the borders or people who continue to immigrate, not just from Mexico, but from Central America, Nicaragua and El Salvador and Guatemala, and then lots of Latin, Latin American countries as well. I taught for four years in San Francisco at Mission Education Center, which was a school for newcomer kids who had just arrived to this country from all, from all over the place. And, and we did a lot of teaching in Spanish so that kids would not fall behind in their academics while they were giving a, a you know fair chance to learn to learn English. Well, I think that one thing that we have in common is this awareness of the U.S. as an imperialist country, right? Because people in Latin America have experienced the effects of that 
in many ways. And so there's that sense of, yeah, political awareness that, you know, capitalism is not a good thing for everyone. And um, I think that that's, that's really huge. And in terms of the indigenous co connection, I feel very, very, um, very moved by the, the awakening that's been happening um, in Latin, Latin America. I was a volunteer for four years at SAIC, the South and Mesoamerican Indian Information Center in Oakland. And we did a lot of translations about indigenous people's struggles in Latin America and Mesoamerica. And um, my sense is that this is something that's becoming more and more and more important as we realize the destructiveness of the civilization that we live in and the importance of ancestral ways and the importance of connection with the earth. And so um, I really see all of us who are mestizos, um, I just did my 23 and me, I have 20% indigenous. <laughs> In the, it's, 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 I think we have a role in helping place indigenous cultures at the center you know, um, and being bridge people between the, the, the civilized West, quote unquote, and um, the cultures that have, you know, fought so hard for their own survival and preservation of their language and traditions and land and all that. So I think it's a huge calling and a huge opportunity to do a lot of good stuff and delighted to be part of this. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rosa. Yeah, it, we used to say that uh, those of us here in the U.S. are, are in, the, in the mouth of the beast, right? Because we're like, you know, where, where the, the basis of the colonization happened, right? So we and then spread and exported it to the rest of the world. But yeah, absolutely. And so I know we're past time, which is unfortunate. Um, I think the the idea of the world getting smaller and technology really connecting people across and you know I think these are some of the challenges but also I think uh, bridges you know creating more and more bridges across both movements and across di different parts of the Latino world um, and and I think maybe some of the reason that there's so much repression against Latinos now because we are becoming a force you know continuing both you know, ge geographically and um, population wise, and also hopefully politically. So maybe we're on the upturn. <laughs> um, oh, other, are there questions, comments, anything? I don't know, Akash, if there's anything from the chat yeah. or other people want to ask a question or make a comment. Yeah, we do have a few in the chat. I'll share one and then um, create the space for others who are still on the call to share. Um, Abigail Lyon and faculty in SLS who has left the call, she had another engagement, just really sharing her appreciation. Um, she learned a lot, she said, um, and she felt the conversation was, was really impactful for her. Um, and Kathy, who is also no longer on the call, left her voice. She said, I'm so moved by your stories. It is humbling to be reminded of what I have also, <clears throat> what I have also heard in the Alaska native culture and the Hawaiian native culture, that loss of language and forced colonization ripped the families apart and tried to erase their cultures. Each story deepens my understanding and appreciation for this culture. Um, and then she, she'll return and listen to the recording later on. But people have been moved by the conversation. Thanks, Akasha. Yeah. Um, others, any of you that want to have a, a closing thought, you know, so that we can go ahead and let people have the rest of their weekend. So any of the you know, panelists I, or anyone? I just please. thought of some, you know, I, I know when we saw the video that uh, we were thinking, reflecting back on the Chicano movement and perhaps today because it mm -hmm. was, you know, a range of, of, of people, you know, a lot of young people. Um, and what I was thinking about is the highest going college student population right now are, are people of Latinx heritage, mm -hmm. percentage wise, okay? Um, and when I think about social justice activism that I see going on on college campuses and nationally in, in political settings, I do see um, Latinx voices, Latinx faces. I think about the young woman from Parkland, uh, mm -hmm. that school who's a survivor. Um, she's uh, she doesn't say she's Latina, maybe she does, maybe she doesn't, but clearly 
she uh, expresses that identity. And she's uh, been criticized and attacked because of being a Latina. So. Right, okay, so there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you, you think about Beto O'Rourke down in, in Texas, and you know, so there's this generation of younger people running for political office, the people, the guys from um, San Antonio, uh, Julian Castro and his brother, and, and, and then the women from New, New York, York City. Ocasio. Yeah. Ocasio, and there's another young woman who's running too. Um, so I, I just think that their education has, though, is, is really the mediator, I would say, for this younger, these younger generations getting into the, uh, the activism in a, in a way that you could say it's mainstream, but that's what it, you have to do in order to even have a bigger seat at the table. That's right. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I read a comment here that Anita put in the Zoom chat as well. I'm um, just thanking everyone, um, Fielding Familia, for sharing our personal stories and raising the systemic questions of A, initial awakenings, two, the importance of place and location, and three, rec three reclaiming our history, and four, transforming the narrative. I mean, I think for me, it raises questions of given that we have such short time and this is a pretty a wonderful conversation. How do we continue the conversation? Yeah. You know, because it's, of course, we have an intersectional frame and we, we care about, you know, a wide range of differences. And at the same time, this issue in particular needs attention and this conversation needs to continue. But yeah. I think um, Tom, Tom made a, a good comment in the chat window about uh, joining efforts um, in our communities, and and I think it it's also points to something that I think I, I sense internally, and and that is it's wonderful to have conversations, but it's also I think moving to action. And it was mentioned by someone in in this dialogue about like let's get people turned out to vote, and it's like not voting for anything specifically, but getting our voices heard in the ballot box because this is we have the numbers but we need to make sure young people particularly take the next steps to make sure their voices are heard because an apathy, you know, is something we can't afford. That's right. We just can't afford it. So. Good. Well, let's, uh, in spirit of that, let's have Sonia, our youngest member, uh, take us out. Go ahead and make your last comment and we'll go yeah, ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, one of the things that I reflect on and one of the questions I think for me that is, kind of been stirring in my mind is how do we give back what has been taken? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that question was addressed in the movie. And one, one of the things that I was really moved by um, was that, you know, we had, well, I think, I can't remember who it was in the movie, but they mentioned that, there, you know, there's a lot of struggle. There's been a lot of struggle and a lot of um, <clears throat> progress, but we have so much more to struggle for. And, and that is to me very encouraging um, as I look to the future and trying to give back and find our voice. How do we give back what's been taken? Um, and one of the things that comes to mind is reclaiming our history. And I think that's one of the themes that's been talked about today, reclaiming our history, owning our identity. And in owning our identity, we gain strength and we gain power and in owning who we are, then nobody can take that from us. Um, and so, you know, my hope moving forward is how can we all come together in a united way to, to move our, our initiatives forward, um, not just um, Latinos and Latinas, but, you know, blacks and and whites how do we how do we create a community and i think that's one of the things that's happening that's not happening so much um in full force uh, across our nation is that there's so much segregation there's so much racism but how do we then come together as as one people we we are humans at the end of the day and how do we move past um looking at our looking at people less than. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. 
I, mm-hmm. I'm, ex- I'm excited. I, I'm excited to be a part of Fielding who has really ch- um, is in a position to, to move these initiatives forward. Um, I'm honored to be on this call today to be a part of the Inclusion Council and the amazing work that's being done there. Um, Fielding, you know, now in the process of hiring a chief diversity officer and really, I think, being able to be in a position to leverage um, this energy um, and so Mm -hmm. absolutely thanks yeah and it is i mean we all know that the latino representation and population within fielding is seriously under under leveraged underutilized because we know it's a growing population but how does fielding become a leader in this space and i think we're we're not there now so i think the question of that i think is the call overall is how do we hold the tension between appreciating the progress that's been made and our own movements um, and how far there is to come and the place of, of valid criticism and the place of activism and the place of anger. You know, I mean, I think there was a strain of anger back then that I think was justified. And I think in some ways that's also a part of where we are now, you know, cause these issues, you can't stand in the face of injustice and just be neutral about it, right? So I think that we have to hold all those tensions. So, but uh, thanks so much. What a wonderful conversation. Let's think yeah. about ways to continue it and uh, any closing comments or thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Katrina. Yeah, this is just Katrina. I just wanted to say again how much I wanted to echo what others have said about the stories. Thank you for sharing pieces of yourselves and your personal experiences as a way to help others understand the broader socio-political context. And I love the direction of the conversation where we're ending up with Gloria and Sonia and others to really, and Patricia just said it on the chat as well. What can we be doing? What can I, what can I and we as allies be doing to work in our backyards, to help get out the vote, to set a context, to fight against racism, um, not just regarding uh, Latinx, but all, and I think it's all part of the rich tapestry that is America. And I think we have to confront it in order to change. Uh, it, it always reminds me of Gandhi's point that you wanna change the world, you have to start with yourself, right? Mm-hmm. And there's yeah. a lot of work to do here, here and now in every community that we're in. So thank you all, uh, panelists and, uh, and- participants.